Hello everyone, my name's Chris Moore, and as he says, I'm a business development manager at RGU. Um, I don't have an academic bone in my body, so hopefully we'll keep this quite light. Um, RGU do have an expertise in app development, and we've been working with a number of companies, uh, helping them to create uh, mobile apps. Of course, we have access to the academics and the students. We're carrying out feasibility studies, and um, we also run short courses on iPhone and iPad, so I do have some credibility to be up here talking to you today. Um, I think we've got about half an hour before lunch, so I'm the, I'm the warm-up act. Um, so this is my presentation. Um, and I think since apps have come along uh, in the last few years, it's given rise to an array of pun titles, and there are some awful ones. Uh, I saw one called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, I saw another one, Appy Talk. Um, the Only Way is App, which is pretty rotten. Um, but my favourite one is Planet of the Apps, which I nearly, I nearly called this Planet of the Apps, but I've decided to call it What's, What's App, anyway. So, uh, welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be asked to speak at this event, and I hope that the next few hours are going to be informative, uh, thought-provoking, and inspiring. Um, and I know a lot, some of you in the audience, but I think, looking from the list, there's a great mix of sectors, expertise, um, and, and different sizes of companies. Um, and, and I think that proves that there's a real appetite in the Highlands uh, for this type of digital media innovation. Um, I don't think there are any fire alarms scheduled, do a bit of housekeeping now, uh, and the toilets, I think most of us know the toilets are just out um, of that door there, uh, through on the left and the right. Um, it's nice to say that keep your mobile switched on for this event, rather than off, but maybe on silent, uh, please, or on uh, airplane setting. Um, anyone ever have one of those phones at the end there? You remember, you see them in films sometimes. Now I think Wall Street sometimes. See Michael Douglas got this enormous brick of a phone. And it's just incredible how uh, how far they've come. Um, so why are we having this event? I think David alluded to that. Um, in my role as a business development manager, I spend most of my day speaking to companies like yourselves. And recently, I've been coming up with the same questions uh, and hearing people asking, "What are mobile applications? Do I need one?" How can I go about developing one? Who do I need to speak to? And how can I make money? What are the sort of business models? Uh, what, what is it that they do? And, and really, do I need one? Should I be getting on this in this bandwagon? Um, so I think uh, this event is a response to those inquiries, and it's, and it's quite timely. Um, hopefully, it will give you an insight into some of the things about the app design, something about its development, the way we market apps, and how you can make money from them, which is the real, the real killer. And I think we're also going to cover some legal implications of developing apps, which is often uh, a bit of an afterthought. And we're here for some people today who have actually done it, who have created apps, who are selling apps as we speak, who are making some money, some slightly more than others, um, and, uh, and people that have actually been there and done it. And so we can learn some lessons, some practical lessons from them, hopefully, to stimulate discussion, maybe stimulate some collaborations, and start a community of developers in the Highlands that are interested in this type of work. So... Let's go back to basics. What is an app? Um, apps are really small software programs which often fulfill just a single task. Um, and it's, it's harnessing the rapid advances in computer technology. Uh, I have an iPhone. Um, this uh, has location awareness. Um, it's a camera, uh, amazing video camera. Um, it's got, it's got um, uh, the video on it. And it's, it's turning, apps are turning smartphones into video games entertainment consoles, uh, social networking portals, um, doing video recording, video editing uh, studios. I can read books on this now. I can shop on it. I can make payments from it. And because most apps are designed for these phones or tablets, they're laid out in very easy to use, sort of pocket-sized screens, very simple to use. You just tap and touch with your fingers. And I like to think of an app as a new way to discover and store uh, and click on information that I want to find that's pertinent to me. It's a way of personalising my phone to me, what I want to know about the football scores and things, and things like that. But it's really just an icon that's going to a URL or a game or something like that. Um, so that's, I think most of us know what apps are. So by way of scene setting, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. Number four, uh, that's the number of years that I've had my smartphone, and it's uh, an Apple iPhone. Uh, 58 is the number of uh, applications that are on my iPhone, which is very close to the the average number of apps uh, on an iPhone. 30, that's the number of seconds it is before when I'm in the door coming home from work that my daughter asks me for my iPhone. 
to play Angry Birds. Uh, she's, she's addicted. Now she, she's, now started, <laughs> she's now started creating videos on it. She's found that it does video. And I have some weird and wonderful videos that my daughter creates on my iPhone. Uh, very funny. I'll show you, show you one of them later. $70 million. Now, this is uh, Angry Birds. Most of you might know this game. It's a game for the iPhone. It's one of the most successful iPhone games, uh, a mobile app game, actually. Um, the Finnish company that developed Angry Birds, a company called Rovio, uh, made revenues of around $70 million since launching that. Uh, it was just two guys at the time. But they've got a few other developers. It's been downloaded 400 million times in the last two years and has an enormous following in, in China. And you might have seen recently there's T-shirts and merchandise and lunch boxes now with Angry Birds on it. My son now has an Angry Birds T-shirt as well. And I believe they're going to make an Angry Birds film. And I don't know if you remember the Mario Brothers film, what a roaring success that was with uh, Bob, Bob Hoskins. Let's hope it doesn't go down the same route as that. The predicted revenue of mobile apps in 2015 is $11.8 billion. Billion dollars. These figures change from which ones you read, but I'm going to go with this one um, from Berg Insight. That's the same size of the GDP of Iceland. It's an enormous market. 98 billion is the predicted mobile downloads by 2015. So what's driving this? Well, more powerful handsets. So like I said, we've got touch screen, we've got video cameras, we've got GPS, accelerometers, um, and that's a perfect outlet for developers to uh, embrace their creativity. We've also got growth of ubiquitous connectivity. Uh, it's freely, uh, through, uh, freely down available Wi-Fi and 3G networks, particularly in some Western Europe. Um, and uh, I think in Western Europe, 3G connectivity has risen by around 17% coverage um, to now 67% coverage by 2011. Uh, it's now 91%. Uh, 3G Wi-Fi coverage in Japan. Uh, that's, that's phenomenal, and that's the way Western Europe's going to go. I like to see the Highlands get close to, close to that in recent years, in recent uh, years to come. There's a growing number of developers, and this is driven by low barriers to entry. And I'll, you'll hear at the end of my talk, there's some tools now where people can just start developing their own apps, uh, tools like AppMaker. Uh, so there's very low barriers to entry. It's a low cost, and it's low risk. Um, and there's a growing number of investors also coming into the sector more and more when they see that there's opportunities to, to make money. <clears throat> and because of all these reasons, lots of companies are jumping on the bandwagon. 51% um, of the top brands in the world had an app at the beginning of 2011. So about a year ago. Now 91% of the 100 world brands have an app. Um, and most of them have more than one app. Um, I think most of them, I think that's the average number of apps per brand is 24. <clears throat> but there are some outliers. One has 636 apps. Would anybody like to hasten a guess who has 636 apps? The people who have already seen my presentation, don't spoil it. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. Disney has 636, 636 apps. And that was when I did this presentation last time, so they might have even more by now. Talk to you a little bit about what I would call the app value chain. Uh, and this is really looking at uh, app production and app distribution. So we have the developers. These are the people that are making the apps. And this is often coders. We have a number of them in the room, a number that I've been working with. And these people are coders. They're, they're computer programmers, geeks, I like to call them. Um, and, and they uh, work in Objective-C or Java, <clears throat> and these are the, the mobile languages that they're writing these codes in. But they also often have a designer, excuse me. And this is someone who has a design aesthetic that can make things look nicer, particularly on the challenging when it's in a small um, a phone, when you've got a small screen, when you have to put images and things like that on it. So they often have a designer and a coder working together. If you're lucky, you'll, get, you'll find someone who's not only a coder, but is also a good designer as well. And those people might also be producing the content, but often content providers are separate to them. They might be the newspapers. They might be the magazines or the brands. And why would a brand want an app where it's really to get promotion, to get traction, and to monetize the content that they're, they're, they're supplying? So that's the app production side of it. We then have the app distribution side of it. And these are really talking about the platform owners. 
the platform owners are those the ones that are in charge of the stores where you're buying the apps from, uh, the, the, ice, the, the app store uh, and Apple. And uh, Google Play is, is the new um, uh, Android app store. Um, and they include the handset suppliers, so the Apples, the Googles, the Nokias. Um, so they're the platform people. And then we have the mobile and tele companies. Uh, uh, um, they provide the wired and wireless infrastructure. And they supply smartphones to the customers. So this is the O2 and the, and the Vodafone. And that's really the app distribution. Uh, and then you have the users. <coughs> so in terms of app production, what are the opportunities? I've already spoken about the low cost to entry, low development costs. It doesn't cost a lot to, to build an app unless you want some really complex uh, connectivity in with it. It's fairly, uh, relatively cheap to distribute through the different stores. And one of the best things is you get immediate engagement with the users. Uh, they can give you feedback immediately. And you often find that when you're developing an app, it's the actual production or the distribution of the app is the first stage of the production, uh, is when you launch it. So that then you actually continually have this evolving app. And we'll hear later from Gavin from Cotican, who um, did the Fringe uh, app, uh, and he will tell you how that evolved uh, over the three years that they've been uh, uh, distributing that. But with the opportunities come some real challenges. Uh, and again, I think there are speakers later who will talk about how we can overcome these challenges. One, of course, is it's a noisy marketplace. How do you get discoverability? These uh, angry birds are, are, are the, the top of the iceberg. There are hundreds and thousands of people developing apps that aren't getting noticed. So how can you go about being noticed in a very busy marketplace? And which platform is the right one to choose? Do we go for Apple? Do we go for Android? Google? Um, and there are decisions that, that need to be made there. And again, some speakers later on will talk to you about how they go about choosing the right platform. Um, and then there's another challenge of, of cannibalisation of established sources of revenue. Um, I think it was The Guardian. Uh, they created an app. Um, to read the Guardian newspaper, but it had a massive impact on the number of uh, papers that they were selling. And actually, people just converted to online and stopped selling their papers. And the revenue that they made from that, can, compared to the amount of money that they were losing at the time, was insignificant. And so it really needs to be uh, as, as much a business um, strategy as it is a, a, a digital media strategy. <clears throat> so there are some real developer dilemmas um, in terms of multiple or single platform, do you just go for the iPhone and concentrate on that? Or do you want to do across different platforms, the Android and, and other ones? And that has massive cost implications. Um, or do you try and do, do you focus on just one single platform? Um, <coughs> is it mobile or web-based? You might have heard of native apps. Native apps are particular to the, to the, to the iPhone or, or to, um, to the platform that you're on. Um, Whereas uh, web-based or, or mobile web means that you're actually act accessing the internet. So with a native app, if I'm, I don't need to be connected to the internet because it actually sits on my phone, so I can play it wherever I am. With, with web-based, I need connection to the internet, so I'm actually doing it through the browser. So that's the difference there. And then they've now brought out a whole range of tablets. So, so are we developing for smartphones? Or are we developing for tablets? Or can we do both? And what skills and expertise and design aesthetics do we need to think about when designing for both? And as a business development manager, one of the most important things for me is, is, is the business model. Um, is it paid for? Is it uh, ad-supported free apps? Uh, apps? Is, it, is it a freemium? What's the conversion rate of going from a free downloaded app <coughs> to one which I then had to start paying for? Because it's usually quite low. I think free apps are downloaded 50 times more than paid for apps. Um, a lot of uh, companies are now using in-app purchases where you, you get the app for free, but then you actually find that somewhere down the way you start paying for things, virtual goods or enhancements. Uh, my daughter's got a great um, one, which is um, uh, a cake maker. And so she makes a cake, she puts icing on it and things like that. But then if she wants to put a little uh, um, uh, sweetie on it or if she wants to put a, a, a bride and groom on the top of it, she has to pay for that. And so I encourage her. I tell her she's not allowed to pay. For, she's not allowed to pay for that. Otherwise, I'm going to get a big bill. So, you know, you certainly need to watch with with things like that. Um, but I think because it's all moving so fast, and again, I think we're here today because this technology is moving so fast and the industry is moving so fast. 
I think it's really difficult to start writing a business plan for this type of thing. And as a business development manager, that's quite hard for me to go and tell my companies, look, you know, I really don't, there's no point in having a business plan. Try something, launch it, prototype it, and get some feedback from the customers, if you like. Shazam, which is one of my favourite um, apps, uh, and if, if you haven't got Shazam, get Shazam. It's the one where you listen to the radio and you hear a great song and you, play, you press Shazam and you put it up to the radio and it finds it for you. And then you can go straight to iTunes and download it. And I just love that app. Um, that, that started off, it's a way of helping you to identify songs, but that started off through premium text. That was their business model. It was a premium text um, uh, a download, if you like. They are now a freemium music retail business. They've completely changed their business model in such a short amount of time. Um, but Shazam, that's one of my, fav my, one of my favourite apps. Um, so, like I said, I think developers should be releasing apps and see that as the beginning of the production process. It's a lot about trial and error. It's a lot about an iterative process, and I hope the people this afternoon will back me up on that. It's about gathering user data and feedback and then responding to the evolving of, of different types of apps. Just want to talk to you a little bit about the um, digital distribution methods. Um, and, and the one that most people know about is the App Store, which is the Apple Store, um, where you can download apps. And these are really the gatekeepers of the content and of the, of the apps. Um, and it's a very busy market. <coughs> like I say, a large percentage, maybe as much as 20%, are unsold and unloved apps. It's not until you break into that top 1,000 that you actually begin to even cover your costs of development. So it's very busy, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll give you some tips of how you can raise above the, the noise, if you like. Um, Apple's an interesting one, the App Store. A lot of developers have, have voiced concerns because they have very strict access policies. They supply you with a software development kit, but it has a lot of many uh, uh, restrictions, and Apple are, are, are quite um, hard to deal with. Um, they can unilaterally remove and reject apps if they want and I believe that if, if Apple make an error, the, the most compensation you'll get is uh, around about £33 for, developments, uh, for developers. <coughs> but it's, it's by far and away the most successful one at the moment. Um, but it's quite closed as well. They have their own development kit, and you develop apps for the iPhone or for the iPad or for the iPod Touch. <coughs> but they do have 2 billion apps downloaded, 500,000 apps available. Uh, and they receive a, a 30%. It's very easy. It's a lovely distribution model. I wish I'd thought of it. The other major one on the mar uh, at the moment is the Google Android market, and it, they sort of moved now to Google Play, which is their entertainment hub to access and share not just apps, but they do music on there and books and films. Um, and this has gone through massive growth over the last uh, a year or so. I think um, 10 billion apps have now been downloaded since December 2011. It was a 1 billion in July 2010. Um, but with this, it's very open, and there aren't many restrictions on it. And so there are a lot of free mobile apps that you can get from uh, a Google Android market. And because of that, a lot of them are poor quality. Uh, and so that's why there's such a, a large number and a large growth, if you will. Um, would anybody like to guess where um, the most downloads per capita in the world, which country um, on, on Google Android has the Largest downloads per capita. America is fourth. Someone said China, didn't they? Close? Not quite. South Korea. South Korea has the largest downloads per capita. Then Hong Kong, then Taiwan, then USA, then Singapore. And the first one in Europe is Sweden, which is sixth. 25% <clears throat> of these are games. But it is a very fragmented marketplace. I think that the two main ones are Google Play and um, uh, the, the, the iStore. Um, but there are others. Uh, people at BlackBerry might know about BlackBerry App World. Windows has a marketplace. Nokia has their own marketplace. Uh, Getjar. Uh, Getjar is probably the world's largest cross-platform store. <coughs> has around about 60,000 apps, uh, 55 million downloads a month. Just want to talk a little bit about where the opportunities might be. Uh, Africa is the fastest growing mobile users in the world. Sales of mobiles grew by 22% year on year, uh, and it's projected to add, an, add another 280 million users 
by 2015. Uh, and, and Africa are leading the way in mobile money and mobile health. Um, so if you're interested in looking at, um, at growing markets, Africa would be a good place to start. Mobile health, I think, is very pertinent up here in the Highlands as we're looking to reduce healthcare budgets. And I think that there's a, a new ways to deliver healthcare in a personalised and more timely way. Uh, you, what we're seeing now is a convergence of mobile technology and healthcare delivery systems. Um, and I think we can use apps to better monitor patients' health and look at trends. I don't know if you're aware that the UK government uh, recently uh, announced that they're releasing around about 3,000 data sets <coughs> containing publicly owned data. Things like uh, bus stop updates, live bus stop updates. And I think there's an opportunity there for creative developers to have an input um, to develop apps around public data uh, to drive re repeat usage uh, of, of those apps uh, and, and to get some stickiness. Augmented reality. Uh, you can have a lot of fun with augmented reality. If you don't know um, what it is or you haven't seen examples of augmented reality, just, just Google augmented reality uh, apps because there are some fantastic ones, fantastic games. Um, I, I have a game um, called 3D Sky Siege. Um, my, uh, my kids love it. And basically you have, if it was here, I would have the iPhone here and there would be helicopters and airplanes flying around the ironworks and I'd try to shoot them down. And you can do it in your own house or in the, you know, look at, up at the sky. It's, in, it's incredible um, as a game and, and as, a, as a compelling game. But this is a real emerging market and it's where data and 3D models or live action are overlaid with the physical world uh, and, and possibly physically uh, manipulated. Um, but it's being used for promotions, for competition. Uh, there's, there's a new saying called tribatizing. Um, where I think there's, I can't remember what the company is, a watch company, where you can take a picture of the watch and then you can put it on your, on your wrist and you can see how it looks on your wrist. Or you can uh, get tattoos and you can look at tattoos on your arm by looking through um, your, your phone. Sign recognition, uh, product reviews, gaming, uh, ad placement, and educational services as well, where you can walk around with your phone in a, in a, a museum somewhere and, and it will pick up an image and it will tell you some uh, things about that um, uh, piece of uh, um, pottery or, or uh, uh, that, you're, that you're looking at. Artifacts, that's what I was looking for. Music apps. I still think, and people that I've spoken to still think there's a massive opportunity in music apps. Of the half million apps on the App Store, the, uh, the, the Apple App Store, only 9,000, very small percentage, are related to music um, but the time spent on music app is growing. It grew by 530% year on year last year. And people are paying for them. What's interesting about music apps is people are paying for them. 72% uh, of the top grossing music apps are paid for, uh, 20, when it's only 24% in games. So I think music apps is, is one to watch out for. Mobile commerce. These are mobile payments and transactions. I don't know if anyone's seen the new bank ad. I think it's Barclays Bank where they can go in and pay, is it Barclays? Where they can go in and they can pay, they can send money to their student in, their student son in, in wherever, and they can pay for things. Um, and this is sending money by mobile. Uh, I think there was a lack of confidence at first. I think confidence is beginning to grow in using mobile phones to send money. Um, and actually, at the moment, only 38% of smartphone users use the phone to purchase something at least once. But I'm certainly purchasing music on my um, iPhone. Um, I've purchased some books, I've purchased some tickets, I think there are discount vouchers and coupons and things like that. And it's going to become even more powerful when it's tied to things like location-based services. So I'm walking past Costa Coffee and I'm going to get a voucher on my phone to go in and buy a coffee from Costa. Those are the types of, uh, of new innovations that are going to come along uh, with mobile commerce. And the Internet of Things is a really interesting area. <clears throat> I think this started with what, what was known as RFID tags. And it's moved on to QR codes. These are these little sort of barcodes, square barcodes that you see. That if you've got a barcode reader, you can read it and it will send you to um, a website or for, to some information about the thing that the, the barcode's on. And it's about connecting objects with the, the, in the real world with the virtual world. And I think what you'll see in the next five, ten years is that we're going to see apps being built into things. Uh, your car, well, I guess, I guess you could say that your, um, the TomTom -tom is a sort of app, isn't it? But I think the car will become more and more um, uh, equipped with um, personalised apps 
um, I think our fridges, I think our white goods are going to become um, um, embedded with apps, uh, tables that we, that we sit at, some of the signs that we see, and some of the toys, I think, and it's just a way of personalising these uh, fairly, fairly ubiquitous uh, uh, objects with things that are going to uh, be more useful um, to the people that own them. I spoke about healthful resources for small business owners. Here's a few. <clears throat> um, AppMaker um, is, a, is a website where you can go on and very simply make your own app. It has some very uh, quick and, and dirty development tools. You don't require any programming skills. It gives you templates. You can test how it's actually going to look um, on, your, on your mobile phone. Uh, it has the ability to link you directly into all the major app stores. Um, and they have, they have fairly low-cost subscription models that you can look at. Uh, Mipin is another one. My App Builder is another one. Um, and what's good about this is this, this, it does, this is not for people, um, this is for people like me that aren't particularly um, au fait with code um, and, and you know, don't know Objective-C or Java, but can go in and try some very simple, quick and easy apps. Um, Mob, Mobbase.com is, is one for uh, bands and pop groups and, and solo singers. And Mobicart.com is, is a good one because it's got an e-commerce um, back end, so it's really good for retailers if you're selling product. Um, there's a, a really easy way of developing an app that helps you to do that. <clears throat> There's two more slides. Um, I just wanted to, I'd like to finish my um, uh, presentation just talking about how um, it's good to make money and it's good to um, look at how we can uh, do exciting things with content and have fun games and things like that. But it's not all about that. And I think that some apps are having a profound impact on the world in which we live. And this is one. Um, this is a, a mobile diagnostic to, uh, tool which was on Windows Phone 7. Uh, and this focused on the millions of people that are at risk from malaria in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. Because uh, more than one million people die each year of malaria, which is about 85% of them are children under the age of five. And that's a staggering 21 deaths per minute. So LifeLens, <clears throat> the LifeLens project, uh, was, uh, they created a smartphone app um, which was used to diagnose malaria. Um, there, is a, there is a way of diagnosing malaria at the moment. It's called a ras rapid diagnostic test, um, which was associated with a 60% incident rates of false positive results. So because they were false positive, they were doing a lot of these tests which actually uh, weren't, weren't correct. And because of that, it was driving up the costs of the anti-malaria treatment significantly. Uh, this LifeLens project, on the other hand, aims to make the process of both, both a lot cheaper and a lot more accurate by analysing blood uh, using digital uh, means uh, instead of the, the, the physical means. And so this is, this is saving lives at the moment. So that's, that's a really powerful way uh, for people to be changing the world um, by using these types of uh, mobile health apps. And that's really me. Um, I'm going to be around for <coughs> the lunch. Um, I hope you're all now hungry. I'm going to be around uh, this afternoon as well. Um, I hope you enjoy the events. I hope you um, get an opportunity to network with each other, speak to the people who have actually been doing this for a while. Um, if you want to come and talk to me about the way in which Robert Gordon University can help you or advise you or carry out some feasibility study free of charge with your company, uh, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, David from Interface for inviting me and thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.